hello and welcome back uh, to this exercise here. We're now going to be looking at calculating uh, probability of a type 2 error. And we'll talk a little bit about power of the test here as well. So uh, I've copied exactly the same exercise from problem 9-1-A, uh, just so that it's something a little bit familiar to, to work with, some familiar context. Uh, so what we're going to do here, there's a, there's a couple of steps involved in calculating a type 2 error. So I'll go through the problem. We're not going to actually do the test, so I'm actually not going to do A, B, C, and D. If you want to see those, you can watch the video for 9-1-A. But before we can get into part E and F, there's a few steps that we have to go through. So let's read the problem. We'll take out the information that we need from this problem, and then we'll begin part E. So here we go. We have a local craft brewery, claims the amount of beer in its bottles is 12 ounces. It knows that making false claims on its labels would result in serious penalties if it overstated the true volume. Every Monday morning, a sample of 30 bottles is taken to test the accuracy of their filling machines. Over the past few years, they've calculated the standard deviation of the population to be 1.6 ounces. This week, the sample resulted in a mean filling weight of 11.2. Are they at risk of facing penalties? And here's our level of significance. So, what we need to do, let's first remember, what is a type 2 error? A type 2 error means that I incorrectly accept a false hypothesis. So I believe the null hypothesis is, is true when in fact it is false. So we need to know what is the null and what is the alternative in order to really be able to calculate these probabilities. So here let's put down our null and alternative. Now are they at risk of facing any penalties? Well, they face penalties if they overstate the volume. So if the label says that it contains more than it actually does. So what we want to test, this is a lower tail test, is the mean filling weight less than what it states on the bottle? And the null hypothesis says, no, it is not less. Okay, so a type 2 error in this case means that I believe that we are succeeding, that we are filling our bottles with at least 12 ounces, uh, when in fact we are not uh, filling them to, to the specified volume. So let's, uh, let's go through, we have an alpha here now of 0 0.05. Okay, I'm going to write down some other bits of information that we're going to need for this calculation. Okay, so we've got standard deviation, sample size, and alpha. Okay, so let's, we're going to step back a little bit before we get into much more. Remember, at the beginning of this section on hypothesis testing, remember how we had these two distributions. We had this distribution that existed if the null hypothesis is true true with equality, mean 12, and here we have our standard normal distribution, mean 0. So every test that we have done so far, what we've been doing is drawing a sample, taking a sample, calculating a sample mean, and then we would standardize that. So we would determine what is the corresponding Z statistic for that particular sample mean within this assumed distribution, right, with a mean of 12, so that's part of that calculation. So we would start with the sample mean, we would calculate the corresponding Z statistic, and then once we have that Z statistic, we either obtained a p-value or we compared it against a critical value in order to draw a conclusion for the test. In the case of a type 2 error, we're going to work with the critical value approach. Here's why. What we're going to do is work backwards. We're going to start with a critical value. So let's say this value is my critical value. We want to determine now, because we know that there's a direct relationship between any given z value and any given x bar, right, as described in this relationship, what I want to do is determine what is the precise value for x bar 
that corresponds with my critical value. So what is that value for x bar that would equal exactly um, my critical value as a test statistic? So what we're going to do, we'll start off with our rejection rule. So here what this means is that I will reject for any z value less than or equal to that critical value. So coming up here, if that test statistic is less than that critical value, we reject. If it's greater than that critical value, we do not reject. All right, this is all I'm saying right here. Now, if we substitute in our formula for that test statistic, and now instead of testing or, or calculating for a range, let's just set this to equality because I want to know exactly that value for the sample mean that corresponds with Z alpha. So I'm going to change my notation instead of X bar, let's call this X bar star. And so here I want to solve for this X bar star that corresponds exactly with that rejection space. So again, what this means is that if I have a sample with a mean less than X bar star, that would lead to a rejection because that would lead to a Z statistic that falls into this rejection space. Similarly, a, a sample mean greater than X bar star would result in a test statistic that falls into this do not reject space. So if I just rearrange this a little bit, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. So I'm going to solve for x bar star is equal to, oh, this is a negative z, just to be safe. This is a negative z because we're doing a lower tail test, so this should be a negative. So this is negative z alpha times sigma over square root of n plus that hypothesized value. Now let's plug in our numbers and we can obtain exactly that value for x bar. So x bar star equals this critical value. We probably know this one by heart, but let's look it up here anyways. So this is um, alpha was 0.05. So that's 0.05 is right in between those two. So this z 0.05, this is the negative 1.6. And then we're looking between these two values. So this is the 1.645 value. I think we've seen this one a couple of times now. So negative 1.645, sigma was 1.6 over the square root of 30, plus our hypothesized value was 12. So let's get that calculator out and let's figure out what this is gonna be. So 1.645 negative times 1.6 divided by root 30 equals plus 12. So this gives me a value of 11 point, let's just say 11.5. We can round it to one decimal, it's fine. So this gives me a value of 11.5. So I'm going to come back up here because now I know that for any sample that I draw that has a mean greater than 11.5, that will cause me to not reject my null hypotheses. If I have a sample with a mean less than 11.5, that will give me a test statistic that falls into my rejection space, so I would reject the null hypotheses. Okay, so that's part, or well, that's really the main intermediate calculation that we need to do. Now we've got enough information. I'm going to erase all of this stuff here. Now we've got enough information that we can address the question. So if we come back now to part E. If the actual mean is 11 ounces, what is the probability of committing a type 2 error? Okay, so here, if in reality our mean is 11 ounces, this is a value that satisfies that alternative hypothesis. So this alternative is that the mean is less than 12. So what we're saying is that if it actually is 11, what's the probability that I incorrectly accept the null hypotheses? In other words, I believe that it's greater than or equal to 12 when in fact uh, it is 11 ounces. So what we're gonna do 
Let's come back down here. I'm going to draw another distribution. So there's 12, there's 11.5. So a distribution with a mean of 11 is maybe sitting over here somewhere. So this is HA is true. And HA is true with a mean value of 11. So this is a mean of 11. So what we want to do now is, if this is our reality, if it actually does have a mean filling weight of 11 ounces, what then is the probability that I draw a sample, I'm going to drop a line straight down, what is the probability then that I draw a sample from that distribution with a mean of 11 that falls into this, my do not reject space? If it's got a mean, if the true distribution has a mean of 11, well, clearly, at least the way I've drawn it anyways, we can see that it's very possible that I take a, a sample from that distribution that is greater than 11.5. In fact, this area here represents that probability that if the true distribution has a mean of 11 ounces, that shaded green area represents the probability that I take a sample from that distribution that will cause me to incorrectly accept my false null hypotheses. So once we've got this, now the next steps are quite familiar. Now we want to standardize this value. So this is x bar star minus that mu a value divided by sigma n, and now we can obtain the corresponding z. Oh, what a horrible looking distribution. These get worse looking every time I draw them, I think. And now we'll find that corresponding z statistic, and then we'll go to our tables and we'll obtain that probability. So I'm just running out of room. I'm gonna move up into this top corner up here. So that z statistic, that would be equal to 11.5 minus 11 divided by sigma 1.6 divided by root 30. Okay, and I'll get my calculator. So 11.5 minus 11 divided by 1.6 over root 30 equals 1.71. Okay, so there's this test statistic here, 1.71. And so I want to calculate this area here. And this area here is my beta. That's my probability of a type 2 error. So I'll go to my Z tables and we'll look up. Again, we can take advantage of the symmetry of this distribution. I want the area to the right or in the upper tail of positive 1.71. So I can look up negative 1.71 and these tables are giving me that lower tail, right? So what I want is this region here, this region up here. If I look up negative 1.71, let's see, there's negative 1.71. That gives me a value of 0.0436 down here, which is exactly what it would be in that upper tail to the right of positive 1.71. So I have a probability here of 0 0.0436. So here's my beta, 0 0.0436. And that's it, finally. And a lot of the work is just building up to um, calculating just this very important number over here, that sample mean that corresponds with our rejection space. So what this means, if my true population has a mean of 11, so that is a value that satisfies our alternative hypotheses, there's a probability uh, just over 4%, 4.36%, four that if the true population mean is 11, that probability of 4% that I draw a sample from that distribution that falls into this, my do not reject space, causing me to believe this null hypothesis when in fact my true mean 
is equal to 11, I will incorrectly believe that it is uh, at least 12. Okay, so that's our answer to part E. So we've calculated that probability 0.0436. Now just very quickly, I talked, I mentioned earlier about the power of the test. The power of the test, if I can just scribble that in here, the power is equal to 1 minus beta. So in this case, this is 1 minus 0.0436, so 9564. So that's this whole area here, which corresponds to this whole region here. The power of the test tells me what's the probability that I draw a sample uh, that will cause me to properly reject the null hypothesis. So remember, this is still all relating to this value here, this 11.5. So this means if our true mean is 11, the probability that I draw a sample from that distribution that causes me to correctly reject, because if it's correct, it's 11, it's less than 12. That's the probability that I will correctly reject a false null, whereas the, the beta is the probability that I will incorrectly accept a false null. Okay, I hope that all makes sense. Geez, my drawings have turned a little festive with all this red and green. Okay, so let's move into part F. If the manager states that she is willing to risk a 10% chance of not rejecting the null if the average volume is within 0 0.5, spec 0 0.5 ounces of specification, how large should the sample be? Okay, so this is how we control for our exposure for a type 2 error. I need to define two pieces of information. One is my tolerance for mistake. So here are my tolerance for the magnitude of mistake is what I should say. So if the average volume is within 0.5, so what that means is that if in reality it's within 0.5 of specification, our specification is 12 ounces, so within 0.5 means 11.5, so if it's within 0.5 ounces, I'm willing to risk a 10% chance of not rejecting the null. So if, if in reality, if in reality mu A, if in reality it's 11 and a half ounces, I'm comfortable with a 10% chance in believing that everything is okay, even if it's within half an ounce. So we, we are specifying both our tolerance in terms of the magnitude of the mistake as well as our probability of making that mistake. In order to control for those two things, we need to just determine what's the sample size necessary um, to, to uh, achieve that goal. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to clean up some space here. And this will just be a simple, well, I don't know, simple, a quick calculation. I'm not going to derive this formula for it. This video is already pushing 20 minutes in length. I'm sure uh, textbooks will do a good job of this, and usually instructors don't need it to see a student derive formulas. So here, the one that we're going to use, it looks like this. Z alpha, Z beta squared, sigma squared, divided by this difference between our hypothesized value and our tolerable value, or that true value for the, uh, the alternative hypotheses that satisfies the alternative hypotheses. So what we have here, Z alpha, well, Z alpha, that's the critical value that corresponds with our level of significance. And so here, this is 1.645. We always use the positive values. That's just the case. Don't. <laughs> Don't get too fumbled up as to why. We always use the positive values in here. So it's positive 1.645 plus Z beta. So beta was 0.1. So what we need to do is find that probability or that, um, that Z statistic that corresponds with 0.1. So here we'll go, let's see, right around here it looks like. So that's 1.28 is that critical value. So this is 
squared, sigma squared, our sigma was 1.6 divided by, and so here, this is that, that magnitude of error. So the hypothesized value minus uh, the alternative value. So here we've already, we were given that. This is within 0.5 ounces of specification and square that. So now we just have to plug in some numbers in our calculator and I have 1.645 plus 1.28 squared times 1.6 squared and divide that by 0.5 squared equals 87. We'll round that to 88. So that becomes 88. So in order to achieve all of these objectives, my, my tolerance towards uh, type 2 error uh, within some particular magnitude of that error, uh, I would need a sample size of 88 in order to achieve that goal. Okay, so I would say that's all there is to it, but this is a, almost a 21 minute video. Uh, there is some tedious calculations as intermediate steps. Really, all of the work in that one is just getting this X bar start. Once you've got that, you can calculate betas for any value of mu a that satisfies the alternative. So this was 11 in the exercise that we did. We could do this mu a is equal to 10. We could do mu a is equal to uh, 9 uh, and calculate the corresponding value of beta. A really nice trick question that um, I've seen. Maybe I've used it. But sometimes you'll see a question like this saying, calculate the probability of a type 2 error if the true population mean is 13. And at this point, students are usually flustered and they've already done a whole bunch of calculations and maybe they're getting bored or running out of time or something. So they immediately get their head down and start crunching the numbers. Well, it's always helpful to remind yourself, what are we doing? What is a type 2 error? So remember, a type 2 error is failing to reject a false null or accepting a false null. So in this case, if we look at these values here, if the true value is 9, 10, or 11, those are all values that satisfy the alternative. So the null is false, and so therefore we can calculate the probability of a type 2 error. In this case, if the actual value is 13, well, the probability of committing a type 2 error here is absolutely zero. Why? Because the null is not false. If mu a is 13, then in fact the null is true, so accepting it is not going to expose us to a type 2 error. Uh, in order to be exposed to a type 2 error, the null has to be false. Okay, so that's it. Now we're into 23 minutes. My goodness, I hope you're not falling asleep. Okay, thank you very much for watching.